you're about to see a short piece of film produced in 1971. It was produced by Peter Price, who was a member of the Civic Trust at the time, in partnership with Henry Hurst, who was the first city archaeologist. And it talks all about the efforts of the Civic Trust, archaeologists, and members of the wider community in Gloucester to protect and conserve the city's history during a major period of regeneration in the late 1960s and early 1970s. At times the quality isn't brilliant, but it's a really compelling and interesting piece of the city's history. It's both inspiring for the efforts of the volunteers and the archaeologists to protect the city's past, and also something of a warning. Uh, it really does show you what happens if these things aren't looked after. So I hope you find it interesting. It's about 20 minutes long. It was built of stone in the Palladian style around 1720. It was described in Clark's History of Gloucester as consisting of two fluted Corinthian pilasters supporting an enriched cornice surmounted by an ornamental balustrade. The windows are adorned with architraves and pediments. The interior was originally very richly fitted up, many of the rooms being panelled in mahogany. In 1965 it was described as follows. One panelled room survives. There are projecting wings forming a little forecourt, formerly with railings in front, but before 1850, the house had been disfigured by two ramshackle projecting shop fronts, which still remain, but could easily be removed. It has been suggested that the architect was John Strahan, who was responsible for some of the finest squares in Bristol, houses in Bath, and Frampton Court. The house was built by a local maltster named Robert Frampton, and was originally known as Eagle House, as it formerly had two stone eagles surmounting the top. About 1787, a spring of water was found in the back garden, the name changed to the old spa house, and many visitors came to take the waters. The best known tenant of the house was the 11th Duke of Norfolk, who was mayor of Gloucester four times between 1783 and 1815. He was noted for his genial nature and generous hospitality, and once entertained the whole of the corporation to dinner here. The house subsequently passed through many hands. It became a vinegar works and ended as a doss house. The demolition of Southerns took place in the same year as the Duke of Norfolk's, but in a very different atmosphere. Concern about the rate at which the city's historic buildings were disappearing had been aroused by a series of articles in the Citizen and was now widely felt. The efforts to preserve the Duke of Norfolk's had been reported, they had started several years previously, but the arguments pr for preserving the building had only been put by specialist societies like the Bristol and Gloucestershire Archaeological Society or the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings. Most people didn't even know the argument was taking place or what it was about. With Southerns, although it was in one of the city's conservation areas, no real argument took place until it was too late. But the discovery of the building's true age and last-minute ideas about preserving it were given extensive publicity. Attention turned immediately to St Nicholas House and 24 to 28 St Catherine Street, buildings of the same age as Southerns, which seemed to have an equally dismal future. A lot of people hoped that the development of an office block in the gardens of St Nicholas House would pay for improvements to the old building, but the owners had no intention of doing this and sold the garden land separately. The feeling aroused by Southerns undoubtedly kept St Catherine Street standing, but no use has been found for it, and its condition is steadily deteriorating. The Southerns episode also changed the attitude of the City Council. Within three years, they had bought both Lantony Priory and 66 Westgate Street because of concern over their future as historic buildings. Almost incredible actions to anyone who was trying to get things done in the pre-Southerns era. Another change was the formation of Gloucester Civic Trust. Southerns also told us a lot about historic Gloucester. When the building was standing, it had an undistinguished Victorian exterior. Its age was only given away by its roof. 
This is true of many of Gloucester's historic buildings, and it's for the good historic reason that Gloucester has always had an active commercial life, and so has constantly changed its appearance to keep up with the times. In the 18th and 19th centuries, that meant little more than giving an old building a facelift and altering its interior. Colonel Massey's lodging is the outstanding example of a fine historic building which is hidden. So as you walk along the pavement in Westgate Street, you wouldn't think many of the buildings are very old, but in fact many date from the 16th or even 15th century. From above, this is obvious, the old roofs usually have a small span and steep pitch. The worst case of a building whose worth wasn't noticed because we didn't look at the roof was the old Woolworths in Eastgate Street. It was in fact a far finer building than Southern's, built in the 16th century as the home of one of Gloucester's mayors, William Henshaw. Roofs speak about other things apart from the age of a building. Compare the fussy elaborate roofs of Lloyd's Bank and the Guildhall with the plain lines of the terrace roofs outside the city centre, all buildings of Victorian date or contrast the variety of line and shape made by the old roofs with our own rooftop car parks. Shortly before Southerns was demolished, another discovery had taken place round the corner on the site of the present Midland Bank. This was the find of a Roman column still standing six foot high in the position where it had been placed 1800 years ago. The column belonged to one of the monumental buildings of Roman Gloucester, possibly the Great Hall belonging to the public baths. This building would have been on the same scale as the cathedral nave. The developers of the site, the Midland Bank, paid to have the column removed to the museum and kept the plinth on which it rested to be displayed later in one of their windows. The lifting was timed to take place on the afternoon of early closing day because the crane being there meant single line traffic for several hours and at one stage the road was totally blocked. We used the opportunity of the column lifting to hand out leaflets for rescue, then a newly formed archaeological trust. This was early 1971, and while we in Gloucester were becoming concerned about the destruction of historic buildings, British archaeologists as a whole had decided they must do something about the rate at which archaeological sites were being destroyed. Apart from urban development, the worst threats came from motorways, sand and gravel extraction and deep ploughing. Rescue was set up as a sort of national pressure group to put the archaeologists' case. The entertainment put on by the crane men was really worth the money in itself, particularly for those who knew at the time that the only thing which stopped the bottom half of the column, which weighed three and a quarter tons, from crashing down was the original iron clamp holding the drums of stone together. When they're excavating on a site, the evidence which interests archaeologists most is the earth itself. The successive layers which accumulate beneath the ground on a site tell the story about what happened, what buildings stood there and what they were like. And the objects found in each layer are evidence for the date of the buildings and what sort of people lived in or used them. The largest part of the time on an excavation is spent in recording the different layers so that the evidence they contain can subsequently be studied. Recording means drawing plans of and usually photographing the appearance of each layer, describing what it's like. For example, whether it's clay or sand, building rubble or garden soil, and making a careful note of the objects found in it. The layer we can see now is one which is very rarely found intact in Gloucester. It's a rubble platform or floor surface for a building constructed at the beginning of the so-called Dark Ages. 
This is a room in the Roman house which preceded the Dark Age building. The walls were once covered with plaster splashed with paint. The idea was to imitate a marble veneer. The layers in this area were well preserved because we're on the side of Longsmith Street and the ground was always covered by buildings fronting the street. On the telephone exchange site in Barclay Street, it was found that between the 1st and the 20th centuries, as many as 12 different buildings had stood in succession on the same spot. Records of sequences of buildings like this cover the whole history of Gloucester and give a picture in miniature of how life in the city changed. 12 successive buildings means literally hundreds of superimposed layers, here all marked by labels. The rubble spread about by the builders of a house, its floor, the dirt which accumulated on the floor, a replacement floor, more dirt, the rubble from the building's destruction, the rubbish which people threw on the rubble, all these are layers and the archaeologist has to unpick them from each other, carefully recording them as he goes. Then at the end, as is happening here, he will draw a section of the succession of layers. At this stage, the excavations at Barclay Street had finished and the bulldozer was smashing through the archaeological excavations to prepare the site for building. One of the finest buildings we had found was a Roman courtyard house. What survived didn't look spectacular, but was enough to show that the house had been like some of the buildings which can be seen in Pompeii. It had a courtyard with a fountain and water cistern in it. This is a wall belonging to the house. This had been the longest excavation we'd ever done in the city, with at times as many as 30 people working on the site. At this time it was two years since we'd started work. We'd spent the last year only doing small scale work to try and complete our earlier results. Once work is finished on a site, there's the task of compiling all the evidence, drawing all the plans and reporting on all the finds for publication. This is always the final stage of an archaeological excavation and the most important. The excavation of a site cannot really be considered to have been completed until this has been done. The builders were levelling the site so that they could use it with their vehicles and plant. Subsequently all the soil was dug out again for the basement of the new telephone exchange which is up to 15 feet deep. The lone survivor on the site is Lady Belgate House, a Queen Anne building. Its exterior has been spoilt, but it still has the finest interior of any house in Gloucester. The GPO have not carried out their undertaking to restore it, and it now has a gloomy future. St Bartholomew's has been a long-standing problem. The late 18th century building was preserved after a struggle and a use has now been agreed for it as offices. Then Westgate Street was widened and remains of the 13th century church and hospital of St Bartholomew were revealed. These were recorded by archaeologists working within the road builders program so it was obviously a matter of quickly noting what was revealed with no time to do a proper layer-by-layer -layer excavation.
The same story went for Westgate Bridge and the 16th century gate tower. The remains were exposed during construction work on the new bridge. By chance, the abutment of the new bridge was placed smack through two arches of the 12th century bridge. These had survived intact beneath the ground for the last 800 years. There is no doubt that this has been the biggest archaeological casualty of the last few years, because if the designers had known about the remains in advance, they could have preserved and displayed them as part of the landscaping work. All four turrets of the gate tower survived, and with the two intact arches of the bridge, they would have made a spectacular ruin. We archaeologists must share in the blame for their destruction. It would have been possible to work out the position of the medieval bridge before the roadworks began, and the contractors would have been glad to avoid the old masonry, which was a costly obstacle to them. The truth is that there was too much work for one permanent archaeologist to do on his own. A team was needed. This had existed informally for some time in the unpaid volunteers who carried out work on the different sites. But in April 1973, the City Council gave enough money for an excavation unit with its own premises and a permanent staff of three to be set up. At the new Tesco site in Northgate Street, members of the Gloucester and District Archaeological Research Group recorded the 16th century building which housed Northgate Motors before and during demolition. Afterwards, the history of the building was studied by excavating through its successive floors. This was the first dig by the newly set up excavation unit. The archaeological evidence showed that the building had been first a tannery and then an inn, and this was confirmed by some of the historical documents which the city possesses. These gave the names of some of the people connected with the building. The names of others, with some uncomplimentary remarks about them, were scratched on an 18th century window pane. The trowel is the archaeologist's most common tool, used not simply to find objects, though of course this helps. Its main use is to search for the different colours and textures in the soil in order to be able to distinguish different layers. Oysters are commonly found all over England, together with other animal remains, in digging the occupation layers of all periods up to the 19th century. I think we have to imagine the river estuaries when they were unpolluted, as massive oyster beds, and so oysters were very common, not a luxury food as they are now. Distinguishing the different layers in the ground is often quite difficult, so that troweling is a much more skilled operation than it might at first seem. A good photograph of archaeological levels nearly always has to be taken from somewhere high up. It's simply to get a bird's eye view rather than one from the ground. It's worth going to great lengths to try and get these high photographs. Often in the city you're able to stand on a neighbouring roof or photograph from a window high up. But where this isn't possible, the street lighting department has been very helpful in letting us use their hydraulic lift. Although only about half the area of the old building was excavated, the archaeological and documentary evidence combined allowed a remarkably full picture to be built up of its history and different uses. Archaeology during the King's Square redevelopment was salvage work while contractors were digging away the ground. It mainly concerned the city defences. 
The Roman and later city wall runs along St Aldate Street, with the Roman rampart on the left-hand side of the wall. Most of the rampart had to be destroyed over a length of two to three hundred feet in order to build the subway and new public conveniences. But there was a very difficult problem in building the subway on one side of the wall and fitting a new sewer on the other side with existing electricity cables and so on. There was more or less no alternative to what was done. The Roman rampart is in this case just an earth bank formed by scraping up topsoil, so in section it looks rather uniform. Above the rampart are the brown gravel and sand road levels of medieval St Aldate Street. At this point we were trying to record these layers by making an ac accurate section drawing. The old King Square is still there as a series of archaeological layers and a future archaeologist would readily be able to identify the rebuilding of the early 1970s, here as elsewhere in Gloucester. What he cannot know from archaeological evidence is how people reacted to the changes. We have been looking at some of the points where attitudes to the past may have been changed. <laughs>